here today. And uh, I'm going to, to present a study uh, that we did in, in collaboration with uh, Google Maps. So you can say a little. <laughs> and um, it, uh, it concerns a class of models where uh, dark energy is uh, in the form of a scalar field, which is uh, uh, non minimally coupled to the uh, electromagnetic sector. And uh, um, our cosmological model predicts uh, the variation of the fine structure constant, which uh, we mentioned. And the uh, originality here is the coupling that uh, depends on the kinetic energy of the Kuhn-Gatson's component. So I'm starting with some notes on the variation of the fine structure constant, which has been motivating our study. And um, alpha, as you know, is a measure of the strength of the uh, electromagnetic interaction. It's a uh, fundamental parameter of the fundamental particle physics. And its value, uh, which is given here at, at low energy, um, cannot be predicted from a uh, theoretical point of view and must be determined um, experimentally. And the, the question that uh, traces back to, uh, to Paul Dirac in, in the 30s is, is um, in marginal terms, whether uh, fundamental constants of nature really are space-time invariant. And in fact, we, we know that um, uh, fundamental couplings uh, do run in energy, and also there are um, extensions of the standard model that predicts that they can change in time uh, or in space. And the particularity of alpha is that it can be probed directly uh, with uh, spectroscopic techniques um, through uh, um, uh, atomic clocks experiments on Earth, and also uh, the observation uh, of uh, um, quasar absorption spectra at large redshift. And therefore, it's possible to, to test cosmological models that predict uh, redshift dependence of the foundation of Alpha. And in the following, I will be proposing one of those models. And I will be uh, taking the opportunity to uh, emphasize uh, the degeneracy or geometry degeneracy that exists between H naught and uh, the value of alpha at the time of uh, uh, recombination. So the uh, starting point of our model is uh, in the classical, we uh, couple by hand, so to speak, uh, scalar phi, scalar field phi to uh, uh, the kinetic um, turn of the gauge fields in the uh, electromagnetic Lagrangian through what is called a gauge kinetic function, which is a derivative gauge here in this slide. And this is in line with uh, the seminal work done by Beckerstein in the late 80s. And what, uh, I mean, this theory, uh, the value of alpha, alpha is proportional to uh, the inverse of the uh, gauge kinetic function. And what people usually do is to assume that H is linear on phi. In the first approximation. And the originality for us is to assume that H, the gauge kinetic function, also depends on the kinetic term of the, of the scalar field. And we will see <coughs> that this will uh, lead to an uh, interesting terminology when we are going to consider that the scalar field, which is coupled to the electromagnetic sector, is in fact the quintessence component that accelerates the universe. And what we wanted to test is. Uh, what defines impedances, which is uh, the uh, slow condition that applies to uh, its kinetic term, has something to do with the putative variation of, uh, of alpha. So, if you value the action with respect to uh, the uh, uh, form potential in you, uh, you can find uh, the uh, equations of motion of the electromagnetic fields, where you can see that it is the first term uh, within the bracket, which is specific to uh, the dependence of the coupling on the, on the kinetic term. And these field equations can also be derived in a uh, scalar tensor theory, where in the Einstein frame, radiation follows uh, the new geodesics of a uh, different metric, objective, which relates to the gravitational one uh, through a discordant transformation. And if you compare the two, uh, the two frameworks, you can find a relation between uh, the gauge kinetic function and the two factors of the, of the transformation. And by further introducing uh, the uh, far velocity vector of the scalar field, uh, considered as the perfect field, uh, 
we found that, uh, in fact, uh, the metric that applies to radiation is, in fact, a global metric. And from that perspective, uh, the space time with the gravitational metric generally known can be regarded as containing the scalar field, uh, scalar medium, which possesses a uh, refractive index, which is H. So somehow, it's possible to model uh, the interacting term, uh, uh, so this gauge kinetic function, as a refractive, a refractive index. And accordingly, the light rays uh, provided through the scalar medium uh, along the uh, light curves that are modified by the refractive index. And this uh, representation uh, provides a, um, an interesting way to look at the uh, interactive scalar field. And more generally, uh, analog gravity aims to, to provide new insights into corresponding domains. And here, we can draw a parallel between the scalar field and a nautical medium in motion through which uh, the uh, electromagnetic waves propagate. And we found out that uh, analogy by considering that the scalar field is a linear dielectric that can be electrified and magnetized by um, the free charge density and the free current sourced by the, the, the charged particles of, of the standard wave. So if you take the microscopic limit of the, the field's equation, uh, you can derive the microscopic Maxwell equations and also the macroscopic ones that are uh, valid in the, in the scalar medium. And from the polarization field, you can even introduce uh, the electric susceptibility of the, of the scalar field as a dielectric. And from the magnetization field, you can introduce uh, the uh, magnetic susceptibility of, of the scalar medium. And we can also note that uh, the velocity and the acceleration of the uh, of scalar field uh, contribute to a uh, current uh, which is induced by uh, the temporal change of the, of the variation field. And in this framework, uh, the variation of alpha is due to the uh, evolving uh, refractive index of the, of the scalar medium. So, now let's come back to uh, our original action. And uh, from now on, we are going to assume that uh, the scalar field uh, coupled to the electromagnetic sector is in fact dark energy which is currently accelerated in the universe. And by varying the action uh, with respect to the scalar field uh, this time, uh, we find the uh, equations of motion of the index component, which is sourced by uh, the derivative of the, the scalar potential and the uh, uh, electromagnetic fields. And in order to test that model with uh, observations, we um, adopted a uh, known parameterization where the scalar field uh, linearly depends on the, uh, the number of volts. So we introduce a constant lambda, which uh, corresponds to, to, the, to the slope of that scale. And this uh, parameterization uh, allows to reproduce the cosmic stories of the universe. Because uh, the cosmic scalar potential that can be reconstructed is a, a sum of exponential terms that attract the universe towards its current acceleration following uh, scaling regimes uh, with radiation and matter, and almost irrespective of the uh, initial conditions. So this is a good uh, alternative to the popular CDL parameterization, uh, because we reduce the degeneracy to the Bayesian uh, influence by limiting the number of uh, additional parameters. So regarding the, the gauge kinetic function, we went and decided to go for a simple, simple power function which was uh, already contemplated in uh, previous studies that aimed to uh, uh, couple uh, dark energy to dark matter this time. And we introduced the constant zeta as being the strength of the grouping between the two sectors. And on the basis of these two parameters, we have derived analytically uh, the corresponding cosmological changes in alpha in a Freeman uh, method so that's a Walker flat universe. And we found an uh, interesting behavior for the variation of alpha, which follows the overflow flow, and which is specific to each uh, cosmological input. So uh, the strongest evolution happens during uh, radiation, domination, domination era. Then it slows down when matter takes over. And finally, it comes to a halt when uh, that energy will start accelerating the, the universe. So here, the sign of the the in zeta indicates whether uh, alpha was uh, stronger or weaker in the past, 
And we also noticed that the two uh, shown parameters are poorly correlated outside that modality of domination, um, unlike other existing cosmological models of the, of the same kind. And to um, constrain uh, these two uh, additional parameters, we um, modified um, the Postman code class in order to, to implement the model and to uh, compute the theory colossal models. And in the uh, MCMC MCMC analysis, we used um, two different kinds of, of observations. On the one hand, we used data that are sensitive to the variation of alpha. So, <coughs> either indirectly with the, the Planck measurements of the CMB, or directly with the quasar absorption spectra and the atomic clocks uh, experiments. And on the other hand, uh, we used data uh, to uh, astrophysical observations to uh, independently constrain the cosmological parameters in a comparing the shift in order to, to break uh, the generalities. And we use these two kinds of observations in combination, except for Planck, uh, which alone uh, is able to constrain both the version of alpha at the time of the last catchment and the version of alpha. And we can also see that the data um, uh, goes from the early, early universe down to the local universe in order to widely test the, the, the right shift patterns. So let's start at high shift. The, the CMB is sensitive <coughs> to the variation of alpha because it, it changes uh, the uh, ionization story in the uh, early universe. So by changing the uh, energy levels in the uh, hydrogen atoms, and by changing also uh, the Thomson scattering cross section, alpha modifies the redshift uh, at recognition, and therefore it affects or modifies the uh, uh, location and the amplitude of the, of the, of the peaks in the uh, on the spectrum. So let's take the, the, the example of a stronger alpha. Recombination will happen um, at higher energy, meaning earlier in time. The last uh, scattering surface will be uh, shifted towards higher redshift. The sound horizon <coughs> at the decay will be smaller. On the other hand, the angular diameter distance to uh, recombination will be larger. And therefore, uh, the um, peaks will be shifted uh, towards smaller states, meaning higher multiples. And therefore, there is a geometric degeneracy between H0 and, uh, and alpha. But, there is a but, uh, CMB point constraints uh, uh, the grouping, and on the other hand, strongly constrains the scalar field close to a cosmological constraint. And uh, the corresponding bound we found uh, on the margin of alpha is in part uh, 1000, which is consistent with, uh, with the literature from this. And here I am showing uh, some uh, posterior contours to illustrate the degeneracy between uh, parameters. And we can note the interplay between uh, the grouping zeta and, the, and those cosmological parameters that are. Um, uh, and influence uh, the, the location and, and the amplitude of the peaks. And if you look specifically at the uh, H0 uh, zeta plane of the parameter space, uh, we can confirm that indeed H0 must increase uh, to compensate for uh, larger uh, alpha at the time of recombination. However, uh, it's mainly uh, the increase of the uncertainty of the H0 due to uh, this extra parameter that mainly contribute to reduce the other uh, tension. And anyway, um, alpha uh, doesn't help much uh, to uh, reduce the other tension because we will see uh, that uh, the grouping zeta is severely constrained by the, by the quasar at middle redshift. And most importantly, it's dramatically constrained by the atomic clocks uh, here on Earth. So, at the redshift, it's the uh, uh, observations of uh, absorption lines in uh, gas clouds that are located at different redshifts along the line of sight of uh, distant quasars that give a uh, direct determination uh, of the value of alpha at different blue backgrounds. And we used um, a data set composed of uh, 26 observations that were done by uh, 
several um, uh, ionization spectral graph, including the, the most uh, recent espresso one, to constrain uh, alpha at uh, this uh, uh, edge between uh, 1 and 1 to 1. <coughs> and what we found is that the quasar data set um, uh, provides a uh, uh, constraint on, on looping, which is uh, stronger than planck by three orders of magnitude. <coughs> and here we have used the Panther sample and the, sh and the shoes prior on each node to elegantly constrain the cosmological parameters, including lambda, which is the, the scalping parameter. And ultimately, it is the uh, atom clocks uh, experiment that gives the, 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 the strongest constraints because we, we used a, um, a strong bound, a strong limit that exists on the uh, curve drift rate, uh, high structure constant that was obtained by Borgata in 2021. By observing atomic transitions in different <coughs> periods of freezers, he came with this uh, very uh, uh, strong bound, which is 10 to minus uh, 18 uh, variation per year, which is very, very small. And again, uh, we uh, um, constrain the cosmological parameters, I mean, um, H0, uh, lambda, omega, and omega, the astrophysical observations of uh, supernovae and performance effects. And finally, uh, in my last slide, I wanted to, uh, to summarize the constraints we have made and also to, to make some uh, additional notes. So, indeed, uh, it's the uh, atomic clock experiments that, that provide the strongest limit on the Kubin zeta. But it's worth noting that uh, the quasar constraints is uh, um, compatible uh, with uh, the weak equivalence principle that was tested with the microscope satellite uh, here uh, around the Earth. And it's important to say that because somehow any uh, dynamical uh, fundamental constants will uh, bring about a fifth force that violates the uh, universality of And that now, provided by the quasars, is also of the same order of the uh, most of the strongest deviant bound that exists on the direction of alpha uh, at the time of the, the production of the primordial uh, elements. And we expect that the, the next uh, observation in the, the espresso spectral map and also with the uh, upcoming or uh, forthcoming of this will improve uh, the, the constraints at, at large and shift. So the main conclusion for, for today is that uh, despite the originality of this model, uh, alpha will play a marginal role for solving the, the double tension, and this is in line with uh, uh, other studies that, that are doing the same. Uh, but I wanted to finish with a optimistic <coughs> note because I just saw that um, the variation of, uh, of the electron mass won the, the gold medal in the H0 Olympics. So there might be a, uh, a more promising avenue with the, the variation of, uh, of, of the electron mass. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yes, uh, they are homogeneous because they were um, 
uh, dedicated to test the stability of our car. Because there, there are many samples, like we have hundreds of uh, observations, but that were done for other purposes. So here, those um, observations were really dedicated for our car. And um, it means the time to the Yes, and it means also that uh, calibration effects were uh, corrected in order to avoid strong effects on the variation of the uh, alpha. And this was the case when uh, there was a claim like um, several years ago that indeed um, we uh, detected a variation of alpha that achieved to a certain So indeed, they are homogeneous. Yeah, or even though we use different telescopes, uh, they are homogeneous because they are already like, dedicated for it with a, um, uh, the same pipeline for, for analyzing the data and particularly for correcting the, the calibration issues. And this is why, by the way, uh, Espresso was specifically designed to test the stability of alpha uh, and particularly to correct for factors of calibration. Okay, any other question? No, let's thank Peter again. <laughs>